Hello, and welcome to Rach Aqua Rel. My name is Rachel, and we're going to be painting a nice, cute, fuzzy bee on a flower today. But first, let me go over the colors I'll be using. I'll be using a warm yellow, a cool yellow, or lemon yellow, a warm red, a cool red, which is a little bit more magenta. I have another cool yellow just for mixing. And a warm phthalo blue and a cool ultramarine blue. And then I have just a neutral gray and burnt umber. And I have this drawing available as a template. There's a link for that in the description if you're interested. And sometimes having the drawing already done and being able to just transfer it to your watercolor paper takes a lot of the stress out of learning to paint, which is why when I do a painting that's a little bit more complex, I always try to create a template with my drawing that you can transfer to your watercolor paper either with a light box or the way that I typically will do it is just with some carbon paper and I have more information about how to do that if you see that link in the description. But for this video, we're going to focus just on the painting portion of the process. So I used just some clear water to get my paper a little bit wet, just all over the bee, so that when I apply my initial washes, it'll be very soft and light. So I'm using my cool yellow right now. And I'm just lightly blocking in the entire body of the bee. Right now, I'm not going to worry about where the dark areas are because with watercolor, we get to work from our lightest, brightest colors and then we gradually build up any colors that are a bit darker. And so I'm using that same cool yellow on portions of the flower that will be yellow or orange. And this portion of the painting process I often refer to as blocking in and the nice thing about this stage is that you really don't need to be very careful at all and even as I paint these stamen on the flower which of course are very thin I really am not even worrying too much about staying within my drawing because those colors are going to be so light that even if they go a little bit outside, it's not going to be very noticeable at all. And now I'm going to use that same yellow to start blocking in the leaves and the stem of the flower. One of my favorite properties of watercolor is that it's very transparent. And more and more, I'm beginning to do most of my mixing 
by way of glazing. And glazing is a technique in which you lay down a color and you let it dry completely. And then once it's dry, you go over it with another transparent color. And because it's transparent, you get a sort of optical mixing, which I personally find more visually appealing and interesting. So more and more, I'm not doing so much mixing on my palettes, and I'm using glazing techniques as a way to create that optical effect of color. And so what that means is that the early stages of the painting process look often a little bit strange and honestly it's kind of a counterintuitive way to paint because I think our instincts are often that we want to apply the color that we think it should be, but I think if you give this process a chance, you will come to really appreciate how unique it is. And so now I've mixed in a little bit more of my warm yellow and I'm just going back into these yellow areas and I'm beginning just to add some very subtle variation. And there's really no right or wrong way to do this. I primarily do this just as part of my process of building up nuanced colors. But one thing that I am keeping in mind is that I just don't want to completely cover up that nice cool yellow. So I'm just adding a little bit of variation to it, but I'm still going to leave quite a lot of that cool yellow showing through. And I'll put a link to the reference photo below as well. I got this photo from a website called pixabay.com. And these photos are available for any use. And one thing that I am doing with this warm yellow is I'm beginning to identify areas on the bee's body where the yellow and the brown are kind of coming together to create a little bit of orange and that's something that I'll build up slowly as well. One thing that I will say about using photo references is that sometimes you'll want to be a little bit subjective in your use of color and that's what you'll see me doing if you compare my painting to the photo reference. I didn't try to just completely mimic everything that I saw in the photo reference and I also I moved a few elements around just to make a better composition. And now I'm going to 
begin blocking in the flower with my cool red. And when I refer to a cool red, I am talking about any red that leans a little bit closer to magenta. And in contrast, a warm red is going to lean a little bit closer to orange. So I'm basically using a very watery mix of this cool red just to block in these petals. And this is an area where in the photo reference, these petals in some parts are almost a little bit washed out. They appear almost white. And so I'm going to go ahead and make this flower not quite so light in value. And especially because I'm leaving my background white, I want to make sure that there is some contrast there. If I were going to paint the background, I might consider leaving those petals a much lighter value. But for the purposes of this composition, I think it would be better to have the flower a little bit more saturated. But I'm still trying to just be careful to leave this wash very light and watery. any portion of these petals that is a little bit more saturated or dark I can add in layer later but for now just blocking them in helps to create a base color that we can build on And when you're doing the block-in, you really don't need to worry too much about having some areas with uneven paint application. So you might notice that some areas are slightly more saturated, some are slightly lighter, 
but in the block-in phase of a painting, I actually think that that is helpful in a way because it helps to begin creating a more natural look. And now I'm using just a little bit of that cool red to begin adding some more color and separating the stamen of the flower. And I realized that this bud down here below the flower needed to have a little bit more yellow on it. So somewhat confused where the green of that flower ended and the little bit of budding flower began which is kind of tucked underneath that flower so they kind of merge together a little bit Then I'm going in with just a little bit more very soft yellow on the bee. And I'm going to use some dry brush, which is why I got just a little bit of paint on my brush and then I wiped it off with a paper towel just so there wouldn't be much water on my brush. And I'm going to slowly begin going into the body of the bee and indicating again where the yellow fuzz, I'm not sure what you call it, is it? I'm not sure if bees have fur or what, what's going on here. I should have done a little bit of reading on bees, I suppose. But anyway, we'll, call it, we'll just call it fuzz. So where the yellow fuzz meets the darker brown fuzz, you actually get the effect of a little bit of orange. And so I want to use just a little bit of dry brush. And you can see that when I lightly apply that cool red on top of the yellow, it just creates a really nice orange effect. And that's why I've really begun to prefer mixing colors by way of glazing rather than actually mixing colors on my palette. I just think it's a little bit more interesting and I think it also makes the process more fun. And now I'm using that same technique to go into the stamen of the flower and creating a little bit of contrast and separation between the individual parts of the stamen. And also I noticed on the photo reference that because the tail end of the bee is so light in value, some of the pink from the flower is actually reflecting up onto the bee's body. So I want to very subtly capture that. So I'm using a very light wash of that cool red on the tail of the bee. And again, for the initial 
parts or steps of a watercolor painting, I find that working very loosely and not worrying about precision or accuracy, it usually ends up serving the purpose of the painting very well because it just creates a lot of nuance. And with watercolor painting, I always feel like it's always kind of a bit of a balance between learning to work with the medium, but it's also really important to recognize that some properties of this medium really lend itself to unpredictability and actually relinquishing a little bit of control because you get some really interesting effects that are difficult to completely control and difficult to replicate. So now I'm going in with that same cool red, but it's a little bit more saturated this time, which means that there's a little bit more pigment and a little bit less water. And I'm going into the petals of the flower to begin to indicate areas that are a little bit more saturated and even areas that are getting just a little bit of shadow. And one thing that I have learned about painting delicate objects such as flower petals is that when it comes to value shifts, less is more. And so in order to really maintain a sense of translucency with those petals, it's best to not focus very much on contrast and to focus more on very subtle shifts in value and also to use the saturation of your pigment to do some of that work for you rather than mixing up dark colors. So on these petals, the values that I use for the shadow areas will really, on the value scale, probably fall toward just the middle of the value scale rather than the darker end of the value scale. So even when I am adding these more saturated colors to my flower petal, I'm trying to be very careful not to overdo it because I want to maintain that light wash. For me, when I do these paintings that 
are very delicate and yet have a lot of detail. I find this process very meditative. I just find it so easy to get lost in the process. Typically when I begin a painting, I tell myself that I'm only going to spend 30 minutes and then I'll put it down and maybe I'll finish it for another time because like anyone else, I always feel very pressed for time. But what almost always ends up happening is that I begin to paint and it feels like just 30 minutes have gone by and then suddenly I look and realize that I've spent an hour and a half on the painting. But it's certainly possible to do a painting like this in shorter increments of time because with watercolor it's very easy to come back to a painting and I also love watercolor because it's very easy to clean up whereas when I do oil paintings the cleanup process takes quite a bit of time all in itself but with watercolor what I typically do to clean up is I just use one of my paper towels to wipe off my palette, my mixing palette, and I make sure that my brushes are rinsed and I put them back in their case. And that's it. So I think that watercolor is a great medium for anyone who is interested in developing a creative outlet but doesn't have a lot of time or physical space to devote to it. And you can see here I'm just using a little bit more of my dry brush technique just to intensify some of those orange areas on the bee. And I'm working just a little bit more on that part of the bee that's getting a little bit of pink reflection. You can see how lightly I'm applying that color because that's going to be just a very subtle effect. Okay, and now I'm going in with my warm red for the first time, and I'm mixing a little bit of my cool blue, my ultramarine blue, in with it. And this is about the most amount of mixing that I'll do on my palette, but I need to begin to build up some of the dark brown stripes on my bee. But again, I'm using a dry brush technique, which is why you saw me wipe off my brush on my paper towel. And even though these stripes are going to be dark, I need this first layer to actually be pretty light. And the reason for that is that I want to really create a very fuzzy, soft texture on the body of the bee. And so when I go in with my darker color to create that texture, I need to have a little bit of a lighter brown showing through. 
Now, even though the color that I mixed on my palette, as you can see, is basically a purple, I used red and blue, which, of course, we all know that that makes purple. But when I glaze it on top of the yellow, it begins to create a very nice, soft brown. And so I'm just using this glaze with a little bit of dry brush to block in all of the areas of the bee that are darker. So what we think of as, you know, the stripes of the bee, that's what I'm beginning to create. And one thing that I want you to notice about this area that I'm working in right now is that even though there's a dark stripe there, I'm noticing that on the edge of the bee, it's not going to be dark, but there's going to be somewhat of a halo of yellow. And you'll see that if you look really closely at the photo reference. And Noticing little details like that, especially around the edges of soft objects, is really going to help you to create the illusion of softness. So now you can see where I'm applying this purple mix on the head of the bee, where I really hadn't blocked that area in with much yellow. And it does look a little bit more purple, but that's okay. Because this is one area where I need to maybe take some liberties from the photo reference. Because in the photo reference, it's a little bit difficult to even really distinguish between the head of the bee and the other dark areas of the bee. And it's especially difficult to see the eye. So I need to somehow differentiate the head from the rest of the body and so I'm just going to take some liberties with that. So now I'm getting more of my cool blue and my warm red. This time I'm allowing the mix to be a little bit more saturated and I'm going to use this dry brush technique to start indicating the parts of the bee that are most in shadow. And again with watercolor, because we work from our lightest values to our darkest values, I don't want to make any drastic leap between the values. So even though this part of the bee appears very dark in the photograph, I don't want to just jump right into an extremely dark and saturated mix. I want to build that up slowly because that's going to, of course, help me create that soft texture that I want. And it's also just going to make it appear more natural and it's going to make the colors a little bit more nuanced and interesting. So in that regard, it's pretty important to be patient and to allow your painting to develop along this process and not try to rush it and instantly have a finished painting. And in this video, I'm really not going to use any kind of time lapse or anything like that because I think that for the purposes of learning how to paint, those time lapses are great for showing the entire process in a time frame that's easy to remember every step in terms of going from the beginning of the painting to the end and having that all fresh in your mind. 
but what you often miss in time-lapse videos of paintings is the patience factor. So sometimes I think it is helpful to speed up some portions of the painting that are kind of repetitive. For example, all this dry brush work that I'm doing is a bit repetitive, but I think it's also just important to see that everything takes just a little bit of patience and a little bit of consideration and mindfulness. Okay, so I'm applying more saturated color to the face. And right now I'm actually going around where I think that the eye is. It's really difficult to see the eye in the photograph, but you'll have to just forgive me if you know more about bee anatomy than I do. I'm hoping that I'm getting this relatively right, but in my painting, I really want to show where the eye is, so I'm being very careful to leave a little bit of the lighter values showing. In the photograph, the eye just really blends right into the rest of the head, and all that you really see is a few dots of reflected light in the eye, but there isn't really a very strong indication of the shape of the eye. So I'm going to try to just use my imagination a little bit to make the eye a little bit more distinguished. So now I'm mixing up that same violet again. This time, I think I used a little bit more of the cool red instead of the warm red. And I'm keeping that mix much lighter. And now I'm going to go into the petals. And this, I think, is actually going to be the only shadow color that I apply to these petals. But you can see that I'm still keeping it very, very light. And again, when it comes to shadows on really delicate, translucent objects, I think that less is more. So I'm really keeping these shadows to the absolute minimum. And that doesn't mean that I'm not going to do any more with these petals. What I mean is that I think that this will be the only shadow that I apply. I may apply some more saturated colors. For example, I think I'll actually be able to use some very saturated warm red to help bring these petals to life a little bit more. But I'm using this purple mix as shadow and this might be enough just to create enough shadow effect that I probably won't need to do much more of that. <laughs> 
And one important thing to keep in mind also about shadows, whether it's on a flower or any other object with a lot of organic shapes and planes, is that you're not going to have the same amount of shadow and light on every individual petal because you can see that these petals, they bend in different directions, they're different sizes, some of them are a little bit more overlapped. That petal just right underneath the bee, of course, the bee is occluding a little bit of the light, so there will be more shadow on that petal. And so it's really important to not apply your shadows in a way that's overly uniform. And you see now I'm, I've added a little bit more of my cool red to that mix, so this isn't really a pure color, but I am leaving it more saturated so that I can start building up some of the very delicate texture in these petals. Again, being careful that I'm not obscuring those lightest values. I really need to be mindful of maintaining those because that lends itself to the translucency of those petals. And here I'm just course adding a little bit more contrast to the stamen and the stamen are not quite as delicate as the petals of the flower but we still don't want to overdo the contrast in the stamen because they're still very delicate and so we want to build up those colors and contrasts very gradually. Every once in a while I have to shift my mixing palette so that I have a clean area to work in. And I think right now I'm going to begin mixing a very transparent and light green so I can start building up the stems and the leaves of the flower but oh you know actually I usually will before I apply any green I'll apply a little bit more red actually and this is something that I do um, it's one of those things that's a little bit counterintuitive but I personally find that I can make my plants look more realistic if I give them a really nice warm undertone. And of course this is going to depend on the type of the plant. Some plants are, really are going to have a very cool undertone. But for most flowers, the green parts of the flower are going to have a nice warm undertone. So I'm going in with just my warm red and I'm applying a light glaze over the majority of the stems and the leaves. I'm leaving just a little bit of yellow in places where there's more sunlight hitting. But for the most part, I can give these areas a really nice warm undertone. And of course, when I glaze over that yellow with some very transparent warm red, obviously I'm going to get a green, or I'm sorry, an orange. I've got green on my mind. 
And this is just one of those things that is going to lend to the nuance of the colors. And it's part of what I think makes watercolor such a fascinating and fun medium to experiment with. Now I'm just going back into the stamen a little bit with that very, very light, warm red. I don't feel as though I need to necessarily paint every single individual stamen, but just sort of loosely creating some separation and contrast really helps. So now to help me get the effect of sunlight on these petals, I'm applying a very, very light glaze with my lemon yellow. And you will often hear me refer to my cool yellow as lemon yellow, but I also think of this as kind of being the universal color of sunshine. And so a lot of times I'll use a very light and subtle glaze of my cool yellow on areas of my subject that are receiving the most light. Because I often find that if I just leave it a single flat color, it just doesn't seem to come to life quite as well. And now I'm going to use a little bit more saturated warm red to boost up some of the saturation and liveliness of the petals. Again, I'm being very careful not to overuse this because it's such a strong color and it can easily overwhelm all of the lightest areas. But I think that using a little bit of a very saturated color in this warm red complements really nicely with the cool red. It just helps to bring out a little bit of life in the subject. And because I use a very limited palette, it's really important for me to be able to use colors subjectively in order to create a little bit of nuance and interest. And I'm somewhat using this very saturated warm red as a quasi shadow. As I said, I really don't want to have any dominant shadows in these petals because they are so translucent and delicate. And so sometimes just using a more saturated color can create some distinction in those delicate objects without feeling as though I'm making those petals too dark. And I'm even using this saturated warm red to glaze over some of the shadows to give them a little bit more of a chroma, which helps those shadowed areas to appear a little bit less flat. 
And again, I do realize that at this stage of the painting, it's almost really difficult to see the petals in, a, in an objective way just because we're not used to seeing this subject in this current unfinished form and so I think that once I get the stems and the leaves greened up a little bit then you're really going to see that this flower is really coming along very well right now because some important portion of the flower is unfinished it makes it difficult to really see how far along these petals have come. And right now I am using a little bit of dry brush to create some fibers in these flower buds underneath the primary flower. And with these buds, I'm going to be doing even less work on them because they're so small, they're not a focal point for the painting, they're just kind of an added detail. so I don't want to overdo it. So I'm just adding a few little fibers using that more saturated warm red. But really what I used just to kind of loosely block in those buds is really going to do probably 80 or 90 percent of the work. And it might seem as though with these stamen I'm just kind of fiddling and everything that I do isn't making a huge impact on that portion of the flower. But again, I think that it's, it's really the small moves that you make and typically if I do something that makes a really drastic change, it ends up kind of detracting from the painting. So I'm just referring over to my photo reference and trying to let that guide me in creating some separation and contrast within that area of the flower. It's also in this portion of the painting just a little bit difficult to distinguish the flower from the antennae of the bee. I know that's kind of a strange thing to say, but they're kind of all very similar shape and coming very close together. And I really like that, actually. I think that that's kind of just a fun thing to notice about nature, kind of just the replication of certain shapes and organic forms. Okay, so now I'm using a little bit more dry brush with a small brush in my bee. And again, I'm just using that kind of orangish red color that I've mixed to boost some of the orange and red tones in the bee. And again, those are occurring primarily where the yellow and the brown are beginning to match up with each other and merge together. So I definitely don't want to overdo using this orange because of course we like to think of bees as being yellow and brown or yellow and black. But noticing those really small and subtle color shifts helps, I think, to bring the painting to life a little bit. 
and the wing is a little bit tricky because of course the wing of the bee is going to be very transparent and so we're actually going to see a lot of the colors of the bee's body reflected or shown through the transparency of the wing. So rather than thinking that the wing should, you know, be white or something like that, I'm really trying just to pay attention to the photo reference. And in that regard, I'm being a little bit more objective rather than subjective. So that I can paint the wing accurately as opposed to how I might imagine the wing should look. And again, I'm using a lot of dry brush here. There's not a lot of water in the bristles of my brush, and so I'm able just to very lightly scrub in some of that texture. But still at this point, and even though I'm using a very small brush, I'm not really painting individual hair fibers. I'm just letting the dry brush do the work of applying pigment in a rough way so that the pigment kind of skips around. And then going in for another pass on the petals. Now I'm using just a more saturated mix that is predominantly cool red, magenta. Just using that as a glaze. And while I'm working on this, I do just want to remind you that you by no means need to reserve an hour or an hour and a half to do a detailed watercolor painting. I think that if you really need to limit the amount of time that you're sitting in painting, you know, maybe this is just something that you do at the end of the day to relax, but you don't want to be up until midnight like I typically am. Just set a, a timer for yourself, and when that timer goes off, you can easily put everything down. And when you come back to it, you know, maybe the next day or so, uh, you, you can just jump right back into it. There's really no reason why you would ever have to actually sit and 
spend this much time on a painting unless of course you're like me and you actually just love getting lost in the process And I think that when you're actually painting along, you'll find that it really does go very, very fast. So you can see that I'm using this nice, bright glaze just to boost a little bit of the color in the petals and also to start giving some impression of those delicate little fibers and folds in the petals. And these petals are really very much complete at this point sometimes as I said, I just really get lost in the process and the details, and so I want to add a little bit more nuance. But certainly I could have called these petals done a while ago. So now I have a much bolder mix of my warm yellow. And I'm beginning to use this with not much water in the mix. In fact, a lot of times when my hand is leaving the screen, it's because I'm blotting my brush off on my paper towel so that I can keep some of that pigment on my brush, but get rid of some of the water. And I'm starting to now build up a little bit of texture. now. We're going to actually apply a lot more texture into the dark areas of the bee. Um, with those yellow areas, we're going to be limited basically to just applying a little bit of dry brush with this yellow mix just to create a very subtle impression of texture because if we try to add a lot of texture into those areas where the value is very light, it's going to detract from the effect of that being very soft and fuzzy. So again, that's just one area of the painting where less is more and being subtle even though it's a little bit difficult to see right now, being very subtle is going to have a much better impact on creating that soft effect than it would be to spend a lot of time going into that area and ending up uh, losing some of our lighter values, some of those initial washes that are still showing through. But I think at this point you can really see that the bee is coming along slowly but surely. And now finally I'm going to start adding in some green to the stems and leaves and buds. So I have that green mix that I mixed up a while ago but hadn't used because I wanted to allow those red glazes on the stems and leaves to really dry so that I could apply a glaze. So that green is primarily yellow. I think it was my cool yellow. And then I also have both my warm blue and my cool blue in there. But I'm going to apply this green as a very light glaze on top of these warm undertones. So you can see when you compare that green on my palette to the green that I'm getting on the stems and the leaves, the stems and the leaves are 
not quite so bright and vivid as the green on my palette and that is thanks to that nice warm undertone. And if you look over at the stem on the left side that I've already mostly blocked in with my green, you can actually see some of the effects showing through of those warm undertones where the parts where I applied that red glaze are showing as a little bit darker than the areas that I left yellow. So it really helps to create a very natural texture that I find very useful for doing any kind of organic objects. And so, of course, the parts of the stem that are in shadow, I can use a green mix that has just a little bit more blue tint to it, and that helps to really cool the temperature down. And since that stem on the left side is receiving a little bit more light, you can see that I used a green mix that had a little bit more yellow in it. And then this other stem that is a little bit behind and being occluded more by the flower, I'm using a green that has more blue in it. And that helps to give a little bit of dimension to this very small object. And now I'm using some of that blue-green mix to glaze over some of that stem on the left to start creating just a little bit of shadow and texture in there, but I want to still maintain a lot of those warm tones, so I'm going to be careful not to completely cover up those nice warm undertones. And adding just a little bit more of that bluish green glaze to this leaf that's folded over a little bit so that it's more clear that the top portion of that leaf that's folded over is receiving more light and casting a shadow on 
the under part of the leaf. And now I've added a lot more of my cool blue to that mix, and I think I overdid it a little bit. So I added it into that yellow mix, and I'm going to use this more intense blue glaze to start adding shadow and texture onto those portions that are even more in shadow. And you can see how flat this part looks just because I haven't done as much work on it. It basically just has the undertone and then that initial glaze on it. So I'm going to start working on adding quite a lot of texture using some dry brush. And of course this part of the bud is, is really occluded from the light, so I need it to be a little cooler. So I'm adding a little bit of my burnt umber in with that mix. I know it's a little bit off screen, but it's basically a very bluish green. There's a little bit of green in there, but it's predominantly cool blue. And I usually find that if I want to start mixing up a neutral color, which of course I need to start building up in the body of the bee a little bit more, I really like to use an earth tone such as Burnt Umber with my Cool Blue to start building up a really nice dark yet rich color. And I'm using this color. It has quite a lot of pigment in there and not a lot of water so that I can use this dry brush technique to start building up some texture with this darker mix. And if you look over on my palette, you'll, you, it's a little hard to tell because some of those wells have paint in them that are, they're very dark, but none of them are black. And I find that I almost never have any use for an actual black pigment. I really like to find ways to mix dark pigments using either primary colors or earth tones because I find that it looks more natural. It looks more nuanced and varied and I usually find that using a black pigment looks a little bit flat. Now, that's not to say that I never use black ink, although it's not super common for me to use ink with my watercolor, but every once in a while I do find that I'm going for a look that isn't 
completely natural. But if I want to create something that's very natural looking, I'm probably not going to use any black. But you can see that with this dry brush technique, I'm allowing those lighter browns in the dark portions of the bead to still show through. And that's how I'm going to be able to build up that illusion of texture and softness. And that's why I think it's always worthwhile to just be patient and build up your colors and your values gradually. Because if I had gone in and blocked in those areas really dark, it would be very difficult for me to create any texture in that area. Because with watercolors, you are somewhat limited on how dark you can go. And again, to mix a dark color, you're going to have a lot of pigment in your mix and not as much water. Whereas for light values, you're going to have a lot of water and less pigment. So if you are trying to build up your darker values, you will want to make sure that you are limiting the amount of water that you have on your bristles and in your mix because trying to layer and create texture with a mix that's too watery, sometimes what that can end up doing is actually lifting up the pigments that you already have on your paper because you may have some very strong pigments on your paper that have dried, but by adding a really watery mix on top, you end up softening those pigments. And then when you use your brush on the paper, the bristles actually end up picking up pigment off of your paper. So the progression with watercolor really should be that in the beginning you're using more water and as you progress, you're using less and less water in your mixes. Unless you're applying a glaze. And the difference there is that when you're applying a glaze, you're not using your brush in a way where you're scrubbing. You're using your brush with a very light touch, and so you're not going to have much risk of disturbing the pigments underneath. But I find when I'm applying darker values, I am using just a little bit more pressure with my brush in order to get the pigment off of the bristles and onto the paper. So now I'm using that same color to start working on the head and the eye of the bee, and you can kind of see that there's a light ring around the eye of the bee, and I don't really want that, but I also don't want to completely cover it up. I just want to leave enough of that light area to distinguish the eye from the rest of the head. And I'm also going to, even though I haven't left any highlight in the eye. I'm actually going to add that in later, but I'm not just going to paint the eye with a flat dark color. So I know that I'm going to add a little bit of highlight to the eye in the upper corner of the eye. And so I'm painting the eye in a way that recognizes that it's a spherical shape. So around the edges of the eye, I'm making it a little bit darker. And then right around where I want that highlight, I'm leaving the pigment just a little bit lighter. Okay, so now I'm going in with some very concentrated and saturated warm red. 
to add up a little bit more texture in that area where the yellow and the brown hairs of the bee are converging. Because even though I did a little bit of initial work in that area by blocking that in with some nice warm red glazes, I'm finding that there's just some areas that need to be boosted a little bit more. So I'm using a dry brush application to start building up some really bold texture and blending those yellow hairs in with the dark brown hairs. And pretty soon I will want to get just a little bit closer look at the bee because as I get more into the texture applications, I just need to be able to see it better. And I think it will also be better for me to bring it a little bit closer to the camera. So I will do that shortly. But for as much of the process as possible, I actually like to force myself not to get my nose right up to the painting because I think it's really important and crucial to work loosely for as much of the painting as possible. So I don't spend much time at all with the painting being really close to my eyes. I'm also going to use some of this actually inside the dark hairs, the brown hairs of the bee, just to add a little bit more chroma. And when I say chroma, I kind of use that term interchangeably with saturation. I think technically chroma is actually the more accurate descriptor, but I think we're all used to the word saturation just because I think most of us are familiar with photo editing software that uses the term saturation rather than chroma. But I think you'll notice with most animal subjects that for the most part, maybe not 100%, but for the most part, markations on animals that are darker, typically they're going to shift a little bit warmer or cooler. So in this bee, I'm noticing that the warm, or I'm sorry, the dark markations on the bee are warmer because they're actually brown, not black, but on some animals I would use, rather than a red, I would use a blue. And actually on some parts of this bee that are dark, but also in shadow, I actually will use a little bit of blue. So kind of on the underside of those dark areas of the bee. Now I'm going back into the stems and leaves and I'm glazing some areas with just a little bit of my cool yellow. Using that very, very lightly. And it's very subtle, of course but just a few areas that I think need a little bit more sunlight or even a very soft halo effect. And this effect of course is very subtle, but I think lends itself to the lifelike impression. <laughs> 
trying to use a little bit of this blue that spilled out of my well. That always bothers me a little bit. Now I'm just using that more saturated blue to glaze in some more intense shadows on the side of the stems and leaves that are receiving the least amount of light. And especially up here where the stem is connecting with the flower petals. And so I think at this point, even though I may not be 100% finished with the leaves and the stems, you can see that just by working on that area a little bit, it has helped give the overall sense that this flower is really coming along. Whereas when I had those petals mostly complete, but then the stems and leaves were still yellow and orange, it made it difficult to see how that flower overall was coming together. And now I'm just adding a little bit more texture with that blue glaze. And I'm very close to being finished with these green portions of the flower. Right now I might be fiddling just a little bit. As I'm prone to do. And now I'm using more of this neutral gray color. Honestly, I can't remember what this color is called, but I think a lot of people will use a color called Payne's Gray. I know that that's not what I have, but I think that any earth tone color that leans a little bit more on the cool side, whereas my burnt umber is a little bit more on the warm side, I think it's good to have an earth tone for each, so an earth tone that is a little bit cooler in temperature and an earth tone that's a little bit warmer in temperature. And I'm using that now to build up more of that soft texture around the head of the bee. So you can see I am almost using pointillism here. It's not quite that small. I'm just making very short strokes. And I am leaving that pigment very dry. So it is a dry brush application. The difference being that I'm not really scrubbing. I'm being a little bit more careful and just placing very short strokes in order to build up a little bit of texture. <laughs> 
and I'm letting some of those strokes go into the lighter areas so that I can give the effect of those yellow and brown parts of the fur converging in a really natural way. And I'm almost out of that color. And so once I get to a point where I can't get enough out of that well, I'll probably, rather than just refilling that well because I'm quite close to being finished, I'm just going to use more of my burnt umber here and more of my ultramarine blue. And what I'll do when I mix those two colors together, I'll use more blue than umber so that it leans a little bit cooler. So now I've picked up my board and this is one reason why I typically won't adhere my watercolor paper onto just my desk surface because if I do that then I can't move my painting at all. The only way that I'd be able to get closer to it to see more detail is to actually lean over and then you would get the very unpleasant viewing experience of just the back of my head. So I try to always remember to tape my watercolor onto a board and this is just some masonite that I got from the hardware store. I sometimes I use these masonite panels. I'll prime them and use them for my oil paintings, but I try to have a couple around that I can use just to use for my watercolors as well. So you can either just get any kind of board like this, or you can use a drawing board, which, you know, Drawing boards usually are just masonite, but if you buy them at a art store or a hobby store, they're just going to be a lot more expensive. So if you have a hardware store you can go to and have them cut you a few panels of masonite, or it's also sometimes called hardboard, I really recommend doing that. So I know that you can't see this mix, but it is just my ultramarine blue, which is my cool blue. And I'm mixing that in with my burnt umber, which is just kind of a, a brown earth tone. It leans a little warm or red. And so because I'm working kind of on the underside of this B, where there's a lot of shadow, I'm adding more blue to the mix so that it leans a little bit more toward a cool temperature. And I'm just applying very short brush strokes in order to start building up this soft fur texture. Again, I don't know that fur or even hair is the proper way to refer to the B, but for the purposes of this painting tutorial, we'll just go with that. But if anyone can educate me about bees, I would love that. I really like bees. Of course, when I was a kid, I was very afraid of them because I was so afraid of the prospect of getting stung. But then one time I actually did get stung by a bee and it barely hurt, so now I really like them. I still don't like wasps though, so I probably won't be painting any wasps anytime soon, though maybe that would actually help to desensitize me to them. <laughs> 
and especially toward the edges of the body of the bee, it's really important to use my paint strokes in a way that do not create a hard edge between the body of the bee and the background because that would really detract from the fuzzy soft texture that I'm going for so it's important just to use some short loose brush strokes around the edge so that the bee and the background can somewhat merge together gradually. And again, I'm focusing most of my attention right now just on the darker areas of the bee because there's a lot more latitude there for me to add more texture. Whereas the yellow portions, there just isn't quite as much flexibility in there. And most of that texture had to be created just with more saturated yellows. But because it's such a light area, I really can't spend very much time doing a lot of work in those areas. And now I'm going back in with a little bit more of that warm red got a little bit of blue in that mix and then I tried to conceal that by adding even more red of course that was probably going to be a really strong color that was going to be a bit too much so what I did was I just blotted a lot of that pigment off onto my paper towel But I think you can start to see how you can use that red to create a transition color in between the yellow and the really dark portions of the bee. And part of the function of holding my painting a little bit closer to me is actually not to paint every little itty bitty detail in there. The function of doing that is actually to keep me from going overboard because if I'm looking at my painting from a distance while I'm working on these detailed areas, I run the risk of actually going a little bit too far just because I can't easily see the impact that I'm making. So holding it a little bit closer to me and allowing me to see it more clearly actually helps me to restrain myself from going overboard with details. And every once in a while, maybe you need to just set your brush down, even if you feel like you're kind of on a roll, um, and stand back and just kind of think about it for a little bit. <laughs> 
because I think that that can also be a useful tool to help you not overdo your details. And now I've used a little bit more yellow with that red to start creating a little bit softer transition. And especially in that tail end of the bee, that portion is actually in the photo almost a white. And so I took some liberties with that and made it a little bit more yellow than it really was in the photo just because again, I want to have a little bit of contrast with the white background of the painting and I don't want necessarily that portion of the bee just to get lost into the background. But like I will do with that little tiny reflection in the eye of the bee, I will just use my white gel pen to add a little bit more white texture into that tail end of the bee. It's not going to make it appear as though that area is white, but it will very subtly lighten it just a little bit. And I am actually just holding up my board with my hand I'm not using any kind of apparatus to tilt it up. But as I rewatch my video and do this voiceover, I, I'm a little bit impressed with how much it's actually not moving. So I don't know, I guess I have a really steady left arm. And I'm using that really light orange mix here to very, very delicately and carefully add a little bit of texture into the yellow portions of the bee. And I think as far as that area goes, that's going to be all that I need to do with it. In fact, I probably really didn't even need to do that much. just going in and adding a little bit more saturation and definition to the stamen. I guess my arm needed a break. But I think when you start realizing that you need a break, that's also a really good opportunity to just get up and stand back, even if it's just for a minute. And then you can see if there's any areas that are needing a little bit more work. So I kind of decided that these stamen, they still just, they weren't defined quite enough. So I'm going in with more saturated pigment, not much water. Here on my brush and I'm just very delicately looking to see which of these little objects need to be further defined and separated from one another and my goal here of course I don't want to outline them in any way I want them to retain their soft delicate texture. So that's always just a balance between definition and texture when you're working on a really delicate organic object. And in this composition, really everything is very delicate in its own way. The bee, of course, is very soft 
It has a lot of color gradations and the flower is very translucent and delicate. So now I'm looking over at this wing a little bit more, realizing that it needs just a little bit of shadow in some areas. I probably should have tilted my painting a little bit closer to me at this point because I was struggling a little bit with getting these lines very thin and delicate. And so I'm also noticing some of the little veins or fibers in the wing. Now from the side view that I have of this wing, I really can't see a lot of detail in the wing, so I'm focusing more on just the translucency of it and some of the shadows. And I also will use my white gel pen in the wing a little bit to bring some highlights back into it. Now, I know people have different opinions about white in watercolor, so watercolor purists will insist upon using just the white of the paper for any area of the painting that should be white. And I do tend to lean that way, the exception being when I'm working on a subject where trying to work around a very, very small sliver of white could actually be a little bit more detrimental to my painting overall than it would be helpful. Because in a lot of ways, especially for this bee, I need to be able to work in a very generalized and loose manner for at least the first parts of this process. And so I don't want to have to worry about a little speck of white in the eye or just a little sliver of white in the wing. So when I know that it's going to be just a very very minimal amount of white that I need in there. Usually I will just use my gel pen because of course I have a little bit more precision with that and I don't sacrifice any of the loose applications of watercolor to try to retain the white of the paper. And masking fluid, of course, is always an option, but right now the tools that I use to apply masking fluid are pretty crude, and so I would end up with a lot larger white area from the masking fluid than I really need. So that would be an option, and then I could just go back in with some paint and diminish some of the excess white left by the masking fluid, but I mean, really, these are all just kind of a matter of choice, and I personally would never hold it against anyone, no matter what method they want to use. One thing that I typically don't do is to use white gouache just because um, I'm still actually learning about gouache. I haven't used it a lot. I have very, I think I have a set of five colors with gouache. And what I didn't realize about gouache, or at least the brand that I was buying, which is Windsor & Newton, is that it's not exactly like watercolor in the sense that you can squeeze it onto your palette and use it a little bit, then let it dry and reactivate it a couple days later, it's actually really difficult to reactivate it and when you do it ends up just being really watery and milky looking and I find that that's also true of my white gouache. So I actually do have some white gouache on this palette that you can see it's in two different wells and I added that 
at some point, but every time I actually try to use it to either add a little bit of white onto my painting or even to mix it with some watercolor, I just don't really like how it looks. So I know some people do that and I think it would be effective if I had some white gouache that I had freshly squeezed from the tube. And then I would be able to add just a little speck of white here and a sliver of white there. But I think that one hang up I have as an artist is that I, I really don't like any kind of waste. And so with gouache, I'm starting to see it as being a material where if I squeeze out more than I can actually use, then it kind of goes to waste a little bit and that honestly that bothers me <laughs> so I haven't quite been able to reconcile that because I really like gouache as a medium I, I love looking at other artists work with gouache I just have a hard time personally using something that if I can't use it all in one session, I'm going to have to just wash it off my palette and it goes to waste. So. And I usually, I don't buy the most expensive brands, but I also definitely do not like to purchase low quality or cheap materials. So the gouache that I bought, of course, is by Windsor & Newton. And so it's not that it was excessively expensive, but like when you buy watercolor in a tube, the tubes are very, very small. And with watercolor, I'm, I'm really okay with that because I can easily use up every little bit of watercolor in that tube. But if I have a very small tube and I know that anything that I can't use in one session is really going to just have to be washed down the drain, that bothers me. So I would love to find a solution to that. And so far I haven't. I'm sure I could buy some containers, some really small containers that I could just squeeze the gouache into. And those containers, maybe they're airtight enough to retain the moisture in the gouache. I don't know. That could be an option. Anyway, I'm rambling. I often find that while I'm painting, my mind just, I don't know that it necessarily wanders but I do find myself having some somewhat random thoughts. And that makes it really difficult to actually talk about what I'm doing while I'm actually painting. But it's also a little bit difficult to do a voiceover later and try to recall exactly what I was thinking at the time or what I was actually physically doing. Because sometimes when I paint, I'm not consciously thinking about the painting, which is, I think, a contributing factor to why it's so easy just to kind of get lost and let time go by while I'm painting because I just kind of get into the zone where things almost seem to be happening automatically. But another reason why I tend to do voiceovers is just because I have two little Boston Terriers and I never know when they're going to bark or start wrestling with each other or whatever other shenanigans they might be getting up to, so. Alright, so I'm just kind of taking a really close look. <laughs> 
seeing what else needs to be done. Honestly, I could have called this painting done at this point or even maybe at an earlier point. It's hard to say, but like I said, when I paint, I just really like to get lost in the process. And it's sort of similar for me as going to the gym because in order to get myself to actually go to the gym, I have to tell myself that I'm just going to show up for five minutes and just, you know, do some really easy stuff and then I'm going to leave. But then I get there and the first, you know, couple of minutes of my workout, I just really get into the present moment of it and I really enjoy that in a very genuine way and it's the same with painting you know sometimes I feel like I don't have time to sit and work on a painting for an hour and a half or two hours I mean honestly I never intend to spend two hours on a painting it's just that for me once I start it's just it's hard to stop <laughs> and I think that maybe a bad habit that I have is that I just I want maybe the painting to last for a long time because I get so comfortable and I get so enmeshed in it that I want it to just last longer and I want to stay in that place a little bit longer. And I personally find that I like to paint either later in the day or at night. It's really hard for me to get myself to sit during the day. I Typically during the day I like to just be up and, and doing things. And then later in the evening after supper then I really am kind of craving just the quiet calming practice of painting and also when I sit down to paint I never think to myself I'm gonna sit down and I'm going to create an amazing painting my attitude is always that I'm going to sit down and I'm going to experiment and we'll just see what aspects of this work out and maybe other aspects won't but I think that it's really important to approach painting with that practice mindset and not with the mindset that I'm creating some final outcome and I know it's cliche to say, but it really is about the process and not the outcome. And no matter what the subject is, the process relatively remains the same. Now, of course, for some subjects, I'm not going to be painting all of this fuzz and texture but I just mean in a general way where I start with a loose wash to kind of create the base color for everything and then I use glazing and dry brush techniques to build up from that base that essentially is this process and I think if you work in that way and you maintain 
an attitude of patience, you're going to find that you have a lot of success. Okay, so I'm using my white gel pen here. I added just a little tiny dot in the eye. And it really, when I look at it now, it really stands out. Um, even though it's, it's really, it's the smallest little dot that I could have possibly created. But because that area is so dark, it really stands out. And I added a few strokes of white gel pen in the tail which are almost imperceptible right now, but we'll look at a close-up of the finished piece. And I think that you then will be able to see that these very minimal white strokes in that tail portion helped just to create a little bit more light and texture on that yellow tail. And then I'm just adding a few slivers of white into the wing. And just a few short and very minimal strokes into the yellow fur or fuzz or hair, whatever you want to call it. But just be careful not to go overboard because using just a, a few minimal strokes of white can really help to bring out some natural looking highlights but adding too much is going to start to detract from all these other very natural colors that we've built because really white isn't a very natural color Alright, well, I think that that is it for this painting, and so I just want to clean up my area. For me, cleaning things up a little bit is actually part of the process, and I think it's good to have some kind of routine for both the beginning of your painting process and then when you can finally signal to yourself, to your brain, that you're finished. I think it's just good to have these kind of almost rituals. I don't know that I would really call this a ritual, but it's kind of a habit that just signifies to me that I get to wrap these things up and it feels complete. And I like to, if I've had some spillage on my paint walls, I do like to just clean that up a little bit. Part of the reason I like to do this, of course, is just to signal to myself that I'm finished. I also really like coming back to a clean workspace the next day. It just makes my workspace feel a little bit more welcoming. So I do try to put things away and not leave a mess for myself as much as possible. Now, that I guess is subject to interpretation because I think some people might come and look at my workspace and uh, clean and tidy may not be the precise words that come to mind. So relatively speaking and in my own perspective, I like to get it to a point where I feel like it has been cleaned up. And then taking the tape off of my painting is just another thing that I really enjoy doing. Now, you see that when I'm peeling the tape away, I'm pulling outward and away from the center of my painting. Never pull straight up, never of course pull inward, because if you do get any tearing, you want the tearing to go outward toward the outer edge of your painting and not into your painting 
Alright, so let's look at this a little bit closer. I know it's still a little bit hard to see, so I might just add a high resolution photo here, but you can really see how things came together in all of that building up and patience and texture and subtlety really paid off in the end and made this feel like a really natural and subtle finished painting. So I'm going to just show you a few high resolution scans of the painting so that you can see some more detail work. And I really hope that you enjoyed this painting video, and I hope that you will like, subscribe, and comment. Thanks so much.